recording out to you. Um, we always send the recording directly to your email inbox uh, using the address you used when you signed up for tonight's webinar. So if you don't see it in a couple of days, just give us a quick search for Simpler Trading or Webinar or John Carter or something like that. You'll probably find us in there. If for some reason you do find us in your extraneous email folders, such as your spam, bulk, um, et cetera, clutter, promotional, whatever names they decide to call them nowadays, uh, just feel free to move us over into your inbox or add us into your address book. We are not one of those companies that spams you or sends you a bunch of crap you don't want or don't ask for. So we are definitely one of those safe senders to place in there <clears throat> just to make sure you can get the recordings and everything else that you ask for on time. And also want to let you all know that we are in what's called webinar mode this evening. In webinar mode, you do have that chat window on the very lower left hand side of your screen. Feel free to use that to type in any questions that you have along the way or uh, just let us know if there's anything we can do to help you out. We will definitely uh, be trying to address some things as we go along in the webinar. However, I do want to make sure to let you all know that John is a very thorough and well planned out presenter and because of that you'll often notice during the presentation that he might be leading you into a question and then we'll have that question answered uh, within a slide or two. So if we don't answer your question immediately, it's not being ignored. It's far more important to pay attention to the presentation as it progresses than it is to uh, have an interactive type thing. But we do realize that y'all probably will have questions and we want to get those questions answered. So we have three different avenues that we're going to help. We are going to have, at the end of the presentation, some extra time to go over any questions that y'all may have, just an extra little Q&A session. We will also, we will also be uh, available to help out via telephone and email, just in case anything is missed entirely. If you scroll up on the top left-hand side there, you'll see that Lauren about herself has actually typed in our support email address and our telephone number. Those would be support at simplertrading.com and 512-266-8659 respectively. So you can definitely reach out to us and let us know if there is anything we can do to help you out and we will be right here to help you every way that we can. I also want to let you all know that, well, actually, so what? We went through a couple of quick housekeeping items. I did this a little bit backwards today. See if we're uh, keeping everyone on their toes. Let's go ahead and do some audio and video checks before we get to the webinar here. Can y'all see a live screen in front of you that says, welcome to the webinar. We'll be getting started soon. Has some extra little pink clocks floating around on it. Yeah, yeah, yep, yes, excellent. <laughs> You know, I probably should have checked before I started into everything else, but y'all can hear the words coming out of my mouth, right? If you can, yep, everyone's still typing in yes, yes. <laughs> See the flying clocks, David says no. Well, I apologize. <laughs> no. Alrighty, I believe we are all ready to rock and good to go. Um, just always like to run through a couple of quick verifications and checks beforehand. Yep, exactly. It's not a webinar without it. You got it, Lorna. Alrighty, better late than never. I agree, Srini. Alrighty, so I think we're all ready to rock and roll. I already have my backup recording started, so we should be all set for a nice, smooth presentation this evening. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself here. It looks like Mr. Carter has arrived, and we will get started. The podium is all yours, John. Take her away. All right, awesome, Daryl. Thank you very much. Uh, happy it's today, Thursday, Wednesday. <laughs> happy oh, Thursday, happy Thursday, everybody. Uh, it's always surreal. Uh, Monday, I flew to Las Vegas for the Money Expo, Money Show, and then flew back yesterday. And then, um, yeah, it's a little surreal, you know. Always well, first of all, travel is always a little off, you know, kind of gets you in a um, little out of uh, out of your bubble which is always good but then it's vegas and i don't know vegas ain't the same as it used to be after about six hours i was ready to come home so um i want to talk tonight um we're just going to dive right into this and uh, i suspect and i'll talk about that we are actually ready for a retracement uh nasdaq's up 90 points tonight is it going to fail again or are we going to get something bigger that's kind of what we're going to talk about 
right? But also just basically what are some setups that are going to be more consistent in this market? Um, I, uh, I've i gone through and I've underestimated the velocity with which uh, some of these moves have happened. And when I went back and, you know, I've got my trading records back to 2001. So when I went back or before that even, and when I go back and kind of look at that stuff, because we haven't had this kind of a market in a long time, um, you know, sometimes a lot of trading is re-remembering. And I was like, oh my, my God, and re-remembered a lot. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. And we will just dive right in. So welcome. Um, so the question before we get going here is, is really um, wondering, you know, is anybody just kind of wondering like, all right, so we've got this interesting situation. Uh, what's going on? And we're just seeing some crazy stuff. I mean, first of all, we saw this huge move from the COVID lows where everybody thought the world was going to end. And, you know, the NASDAQ and the stock market actually went ballistic uh, from approximately four. Wow. Uh, I've got a, my, um, my hand has a, 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 not a cast, but I, I kind of smashed my thumb. And uh, so I can't, I guess apparently I can't draw with that. So let's say I'll draw with my mouse. So from 420 to about a boot 1221 all right we had one of the fiercest most magnificent rallies uh that we've seen and since then now here we are a lot of things are unraveling to put it lightly the nasdaq is now 50 percent off of its highs from the covid lows to the december highs uh, crypto is crashing. The dollar is exploding. I think you guys have probably seen what happened with Luna. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but one of the things that we want to, I want to talk about tonight is just the idea that it's easy to get lulled into complacency. It's easy that we get conditioned, that we expect the market to behave one way. And when that happens, if we don't change our strategy, it just becomes more difficult. And so that's what we're just going to talk about tonight and just kind of see what's happening. Yeah, it's not a split. I mean, I didn't break it, but I have a... Uh, it's a wrist guard. It's not a wrist guard, but you can order thumb guards on Amazon and, you know, it just keeps it. You just can't move it. So I've got a, basically a sprained thumb, which really is no fun. If any, if you, if any of you ever sprain your thumbs, just let me know. I've got uh, some great, great things that you can wear. So um, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, I remember seeing stuff like this uh, post 2000. So and, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, but there are so many comparisons between what's happening now and what happened then. Because remember, what happened then was a was a, a compression. It was a growth compression. Okay, and if if you guys understand what happened during COVID, we had essentially a growth compression, meaning that the move to essentially you know working from home, right? That was something that was. Uh, trending to happen over the next decade, and instead it got forced into happening in like 60 days. So Zoom, you know, all the uh, software companies that could benefit from that, and that exploded. Well, you guys remember what the compression was that uh, for 2000 uh, that that happened in 1999? Um, believe it or not, it was Y2K. So Y2K had the same uh, velocity and doom and uh, f essentially a lot of forced actions because of the panic and shareholders were demanding that companies prepare for Y2K because shareholders were scared. And so capital expenditures exploded um, as companies were getting ready for this. And the, you know, the valuations of these companies also exploded. And that's kind of similar to what happened during this run up with COVID. And yeah, yeah, cause from exiting trades. Um, so it's important, and so I'm going to go back to that parallel to kind of show not only kind of what to expect with what's happening now, but also like, okay, what are some ways to trade it? But but post 2000, a lot of things that would happen was stuff like this. You know, the famous example was Pets.com, where they blew their whole two million dollar advertising budget for the year on the February 2000 Super Bowl commercial, and I think in uh, you know by April they were out of business. So this this company. You know, they started off down here saying, all right, we're going to quantitatively, we're going to peg this to the dollar. 
it got as high as 120 uh, with a market cap of 45 billion uh, as of March 1st. And then it came down, came down with a respectable pullback to about 84. And then in the last two days has basically gone to zero. So $45 billion in market cap wiped out in a matter of days. This happened all the time once the tide went out post 2000. And we just wanna ask ourselves, what else out there that we once thought was innovation was actually just a result of excess Fed liquidity? And when you're in the middle of it, it's very, very, very easy to get the two confused. And uh, that's what we want to kind of take a look at and see how that can happen. Um, I, I always, I'm not going to go into the story too much. This is something that, it, you know, I think this was in 1996. Uh, this is a story I talk about in my book, but it just kind of forms the basis for whenever I like to take a pause and look at the markets, you know, it always comes back to this. Uh, but, you know, when I had a job in corporate America and I got recruited or promoted to, um, you know, a district office in Minnesota and I accepted it and my fiance at the time and now my wife came with me and she had never seen snow before and we moved there in January. And the short version is we had an apartment you know, she, she su suggested strongly that we get a house or that she'd have to move back to Texas. And um, so I had at that point was, a, I, was I was ready to quit corporate America. You know, I was, that's what I was gearing for. I'd built up a trading account of $150,000. And up to that point, I had boom busted three times uh, or two times. So like about 10K to 100K and, and then it would blow up. And so I had the risk taking part down, but I was, you know, as they said, as the saying goes in trading, making money is the easy part. It's keeping it as the game. And then this time around, I just thought like, well, geez, I don't want to, you know, this is a good amount. I want to trade this, you know, wire out a steady amount every week and that can replace my income from my job. But we needed $30,000 for the down payment. And what I did one night is thought, you know what, I don't want to, I don't want to take $30,000 out of my trading account and drop it to 120,000. I, I I'm just going to do a big trade and make $30,000. I'll buy the house. Um, I'll still have my job, so I can show the income. So the bank approves my mortgage, and then and shortly after that, we can kind of wrap wrap this whole um, career thing and, and put it to bed, and I can trade full time. So needless to say, I I saw a setup and I went all in, and I bought puts on the OEX. And because the market was downtrending and it was rallying back up to the downtrend line, I was like, oh, perfect. So I, I loaded up and the next morning the market ex gapped up like the Dow was up 200 points back when the Dow was a lot lower than it is today. And it just went up four days in a row like that. It never pulled back. And I got wiped out by the time I realized I needed to close out my position so I could buy the house. I only had eight thousand dollars left. and. Uh, so I, you know, I ended up maxing out credit cards and getting the cash so we could get the house because I was more scared of disappointing my fiance um, than about anything else. And it worked and miraculously. We were able to get the house, um, but I was devastated. I just my dreams got really blown up. And during this time, I took about six months off. Um, I had taken some of my trading profits. I had bought some real estate, you know, down payments. I had some rare coins. So I had the funds where if I wanted to scrape together another account, I could, but I had to ask myself, do I really want to do that? Do I really want to put my family through the ups and downs of this? Cause this is insane. And, and during the six month period, I found Mark Douglas's book, the disciplined trader. And, um, years later, I, uh, he and I became friends and we worked together very closely for about a decade. Um, you know, he, and he wrote, of course, Trading in the Zone. He would come speak at our conferences and, and things like that. And of course, and, and, uh, unfor and he passed away very sadly about four years ago. But um, that set me on the path of essentially a very simple process and that any time I focused on the money, trading got harder. But any time I would step back and just focus on the setups, uh, trading got easier. And, and there's certainly been times this year as the market changed where I found myself going like, man, I am just, I'm trying to chase the money here. What's going on? The market's changing. I need to step back and focus on the setups. And that prompted me to go back and to say like, okay, well, what kind of market environment are we in? Because the market environment today is a lot different than it was in 2020, even during the down move in March, 2020. Um, that was, you know, your typical flush trade, which is fun to trade, but what's happening now is a lot different. 
So I went back and dusted that off and, and wanted to take a look at it and to say like, okay, what, what setups am I, am I missing here? So the first thing that we want to, I did try ice fishing. Yeah, it was, uh, it was fun for a day. I don't know if I'd want to, you know, I would rather fly to Duluth and go ice fishing, um, I guess, and then go there. But I, I, I love, we actually really loved, uh, loved it there in the summer, but man, the winters were certainly long. Yeah, it was so cold. It's hard to explain how cold it is in the far north if you've never been there. You know, like wind chills of 60 below zero. So um, so the first thing we want to understand is there are four market phases. Now, this is on any time frame. So uh, if you think of the larger time frames, like, like let's say a weekly chart, okay? A weekly chart, um, there's going to be phases of accumulation, phases of advancing, phases of distribution, and phases of declining. And, you know, we've had a huge advancing market for the last two years. Um, prior to that, you know, we had some accumulation and things like that. And then about, you know, December, I would argue December through January and February, we saw distribution. And now we're on a full on declining market. And a lot of this is triggered when the price falls below the 200 moving average on the daily chart. And the main, the main point of all this is that these four phases uh, different setups work in each phase. Now, if you like to just buy the dip, that's fine. In an accumulation market, you're channel trading, right? You're not buying dips looking for new highs. You're just like, okay, I'm going to buy this pullback to support, and then I'm going to get out at resistance. That's that's accumulation trading. In an advancing market, you can buy the dip and hold on for new highs, right? That's that's kind of the where you can essentially make the most money because there's not necessarily a limitation to how high the stock can go, i.e. Tesla being a classic example of that, as is Google. Distribution is a little different. Um, distribution is kind of like, you know, when you buy something, the rallies are short-lived. There's just more downside pressure, but it doesn't break. So let's get, you know, iron condors and things like that, you know, getting more active inputs. And then a declining market, a declining market has two phases. And right now we're in this phase where um, it's hard to get short if you're not already short because you don't want to short the lows. But on the other hand, you're not really getting any retracements to trade either. And so it's, it's the most difficult if you aren't already positioned for it. And so we want to kind of see where we are now. Yeah, it's a dry cold. We just kind of want to see um, where, where we are, right? And what are some ways and strategies to trade it? So as a quick recap, those of you that have been following me know, you know, 2020 was a stellar year. Uh, started off with a 1.4-ish million dollars and ended up with a uh, ending balance of 19.6 million dollars. So it was insanity. 2021 started off with more and traded it a little bit more conservatively and peaked earlier. Whereas in 2021, my PL ended at the highs of the year. Um, here uh, peaked at about August, and after that, it was just kind of a chop, 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 and ended up 210% with 13 million in profits and wiring money out. And then, uh, so the lessons learned from this was in 2020. Now, this is, um, I say I averaged 5% a week, but it wasn't like every week, like, oh, here's another 5%. You know, some weeks it was like, wow, here's a big trade, here's 20%. And then another week, it might have been minus 5%. But over the course of a year, 5% a week turns into about 1,200% you know, give or take. But the main lesson here is that when the conditions are right and the conditions are fail favorable and the wind is at your back, be aggressive because you don't get a lot of, you know, those markets aren't like that all the time, but when they are, you want to recognize it and you want to be aggressive and you just simply want to work on your emotional fortitude to hold through the wiggles. 2021, my average was about 2.25% a week. And the main lesson here was making money is easy, keep it as the game. And when something stops working, cut trading size drastically. And that's something that's very, very important. You know, if things just are like, wow, they're not working, cut it down, you know, 1%, 2% trades and wait till you get back into a groove before you, you know, pump up your size again. Both years, I was very aggressive about wiring out trading profits and putting them into tangible assets and experiences. This does provide a psychological edge. 2022 so far has been trickier, okay? It's kind of like the great unwinding. And while there's been some some very solid trades, it's also been a lot of headwinds and feeling, feeling like I'm kind of in a battle here. And it's like, all right, let's take a deep breath and see what we are in this markets and what are the setups that work best in this environment. And we all know nothing goes straight up or straight down forever, but we also need to recognize when the direction of major major order flow changes based on a huge, huge macro change. 
So um, I'm a huge fan of physical assets. Uh, the one thing I've learned is that physical assets are great, but they're not easy. You know, I've had stacks of silver and gold and stuff like that. And I always joke about this. You know, I loaded up on 25,000 ounces of silver um, back in 2005, 2006, looking for the great financial depression. And I got a good price on it. I ended up getting out at a decent price. But when I wanted to get out, you know, it took three days to pack up. Um, I think I had to get a handgun and uh, go and, you know, drop it off and mail it and wait for the checks, you know, versus, you know, had I just done like, say, five futures contracts, I could have right clicked and got out. That being said, the one thing that's happening right now, too, is that over the last decade or so, Wall Street's convinced everyone and their mother to focus on financial assets because they are easier because you can right click. But then when you start to see things implode like Luna, it really makes you appreciate having hard assets. And I think that there's going to be a resurgence back into tangible assets. And, you know, this is something to be aware of. So here's a quote from one of my trading mentors, traders are born, they're not born with the patience gene, they have to learn it, mostly through brutal lessons. Trading is merely a game of the patient taking money from the impatient. And I always find that trading is finding the right balance of patience and determination. Um, determination, patience, and courage are the only things needed to improve any situation. What I found is that the opposite, um, so, you know, impatience, if you have determination and courage, but impatience, you're dead. So that's that's the key part. You know, you need patience, but you still need the courage to try and determination to see it through. Um, but if you're impatient and you have determination and courage, you're dead. So it's really an important, it's a really important thing. So what's happening right now? So in a nutshell, we are experiencing the fastest tightening financial conditions in history. A lot of people don't realize that. And when I mention that, a lot of times people say, well, that's ridiculous. We've only had two rate hikes. This is not the fastest conditions in history. Okay, well, that's absolutely not the only piece of the puzzle. And there's a couple of reasons that you can, or a couple of ways to tell. The first thing is that when you start to see things that were once considered innovative, um, we can see now that things are just getting thrown out on the trash heap, okay, as the Fed takes away easy money, Luna being a classic example of that, and it's just the beginning. So this is, um, you know, here we got that, again, we had that $45 billion market cap, we're at $120, and boom, we're at zero. Now, I've talked to a couple of people here that are like, they're, they're loading up here. But but honestly, this is done. There's, I mean, I never say never, but there's never any way that this thing is going to come all the way back. This is done. It's destroyed. It's like, um, you know, there's this, it's like there are things that go out of business. And on something like this, when it gets wiped out like that, the problem is everybody's lost confidence in it. And if you've lost confidence in it, you're not going to buy it. And it's done. And it's just important to understand, it's important to understand that. Uh, what about Bitcoin? You know, I'm a fan of Bitcoin. I've bought my first Bitcoin when I was at 200 and have, you know, I, I like to allocate uh, towards that. But the thing to remember is that Bitcoin is an asset that appreciates in, a, in an environment where the Fed is has easy money. I think it's very possible that Bitcoin comes all the way down to where it was pre-COVID. I would, I would buy some there. And, uh, you know, I think that the, you know, the idea that, um, you know, there's a lot of Bitcoin people out there that make a living pushing Bitcoin. Um, and while I admire what Michael Saylor has done, and I have no, um, um, what's the right term I'm looking for here? You know, nothing against what he's done. Um, he obviously has a vested interest in only providing good news about Bitcoin. And I think, you know, I think he gets a margin call if it goes down to 22,000. And guess what? the market is very much going to go to, to that level to test that theory. And it will probably go lower than that. Um, yeah, now I've held Bitcoin. I, you know, of course, when you get spiked up there, it's always good to take some chips off the table. But, you know, I think the idea that, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin in 10 years is either, you know, half a million dollars or it's zero. So, you know, it's, a, it's one of those kind of a things. The thing that will help Bitcoin is if we go back into quantitative easing, which I believe that we will. So the reality, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, just real quick, because we just want to understand the situation, but we currently have three major macro issues unfolding before our eyes. 
So I already talked about the rise in interest rates. It's like, well, geez, there's been two rate hikes. Why is the system so fragile? But it's not the actual, um, the actual interest rates going up that's done it, meaning that they did a, a, a quarter point rate hike and then a half point rate hike. It's their talk. So through their talk, they've caused bonds to plummet. They've had the bonds that had the worst quarter, I think, in the history of the bond market. And that caused mortgage rates to double. So you would think like, geez, well, they only if mortgage rates were at two and a quarter percent, you know, at the beginning of the year or 2.5 percent and the Fed hiked a point, you know, a quarter point, a half point, wouldn't mortgage rates be at 3.25 percent now? You would think that, right? But they're actually at 5.25 percent. That's how they want this to happen. They are talking up the markets so that financial conditions tighten. Uh, NASDAQ's up 100 now, by the way. I do think we're going to get a pretty good retracement tomorrow. We'll talk more about that. Next, we got the rise in commodity prices. Uh, gasoline's up 60% year over year. Heating costs are up 30% year over year. Food is up 12% year over year. Um, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And then third is the rise in the U.S. dollar. Debt around the world is in dollars. As the dollar rises, more and more currency is needed to make those payments. So on, on their own, each one of these individually represents a huge tightening of financial conditions, but the combination of all three is unprecedented. That is why we're seeing destruction in some of the more speculative speculative assets, and that is going to continue, and it's important to understand that. So when we have a situation like this, we can see that, okay, and I, and I took this last week when the NASDAQ was at 13,000. Since then, it's dropped another 1,000 points. The dollar is up another point. Uh, interest rates are up more, and you know this this at the same time. And in this chart of truth, uh, let me. I see a couple of. Uh, I lost sound, so let me give it a minute here. Yeah, I just noticed my uh, trade station restarting. Okay, we got it back. Okay, so um, so the reason you want to look at the dollar right now is that it is the chart of truth, and as long as the dollar is going higher, and by the way, we're at twenty-year highs. The last time we were here was in two thousand two, and it's the chart of truth. And the fact that this is going up, just keep in mind that means something is broken. We don't necessarily know exactly what, but when there's such an insane shortage of dollars right now. It means that a lot of things have to get unwound to meet the demand for those dollars. Like there's, you know, all these funds that have hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, they're not buying calls on Apple, right? They're, uh, you know, long dollar, short the yen, long Greek debt, blah, 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 blah. And they're all correlated. And when those correlations break, they got to start unwinding it and it wreaks havoc on the financial system. And, you know, the other day I was talking to someone made the point that it was like, you know, either either the Fed has to learn to live with higher normalized inflation. You know, the idea that we're going to get back to 2 percent, uh, I don't think is going to happen. But could we get it down to four or five percent for a while to kind of make up for the times it was only one percent and, and that that's going to be a new normal. But if the Fed truly wants to get back to two percent, they're going to have to break the system. And maybe they want to. Uh, we'll talk more about that, too. But more importantly, we just want to know how to trade this. Um, we are already seeing some of the high flying stuff get destroyed. Um, you know, Zoom done, Netflix done. Oh, that's supposed to be Peloton, but you know, you guys know Peloton's done. So, so where are we now? So I took these today, right before we did this. Um, let's see here. So this is a weekly chart of the spiders. So here's the key things I'm looking at here. When, um, when we flushed here uh, in the initial COVID lockdowns and, and everybody was nervous, oh, that's interesting. I see a wildebeest in my front yard. That's not good. Um, they jumped the fence somehow. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna, I'll get a picture real quick. I'll have to show, if I can get one and I'll show you guys. Uh, okay, I don't see him now. Anyway, that's funny. 
Um, yeah, I hate it when that happens. Yeah, they're, they're like at the stairs in my front yard. Okay, wow. All right, well, that'll give me something to do after this is over. Okay, so the main things that we want to look at here. During the, the COVID meltdown, <laughs> it's the first, that's the first, yeah, it's, uh, we have some unusual days out here in Wimberley, Texas. So during the COVID meltdown, take a note of the volume, okay? This is called capitulation. And capitulation is when you get, and remember, this was like a 40% decline. It, oh, this is in the spiders, right? And this was the fastest down move, the second fastest down move in the S&P 500 in history, okay? It's never, to put this in perspective, uh, this 40% move happened in like three and a half weeks. The 2008 crash, a 40% move took 17 months, which I know probably seems insane because it seems like it was a lot more than that, but it literally took 17 months to go 40%. Whereas 40% in March happened in three and a half weeks. So just to put that in perspective. But we had capitulation in the form of volume and capitulation is simply... Um, when people are leveraged or they're nervous, um, they just keep, and, and selling begets more selling. You know, if they were nervous here, they're more nervous here. And finally, they, when they can't take the pain anymore, they throw them in the towel. The biggest thing I saw here was literally right here, a lot of my friends trade, but they invest in passive index funds, bailed. Like they literally all bailed at the, about the same time, mass psychology. And the other thing that's odd is once we made new highs, you know, they started getting in back here and then ironically, here we are. And so, you know, all the gains that they've participated in are gone. And so that's, that's, and that's common if you're trying to, you know, time it, stuff like that with, with that kind of stuff. So here we've had a decline. Now the decline, you know, isn't horrible from this low to this high. It's a 382 retracement. So it's not horrible. Um, and you can see this is the dollar here, but the main thing is there's no capitulation in any way, shape or form, at least in the S&P 500. So is this complacency? You know, is this the sign of something that we're just getting started with? Well, to be fair, the S&P 500 it is a much more balanced um, index. You know, this is also where there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things here that, um, you know, you've got healthcare, uh, you, you know, you've got like, you know, Pepsi, you know, stocks that are actually doing okay. So it's certainly a more balanced index and not as much fear there. What about the Qs? So if we look at the cues, it's a different story, all right? So we are already from the COVID lows to the December highs, we are already at a 50% retracement, all right? This is important for a lot of reasons. The other thing that we've seen too is that we had, here was capitulation during COVID, here's, here's the volume now. It's pretty close. You know, you could argue that capitulation is happening in the tech sector. And of course, as we all know, um, not only are we seeing stocks, you know, like Peloton and Zoom and Netflix get absolutely obliterated, Shopify, but once an index drops um, a certain point, people also start to panic. However, I do think that the idea here that we're having the same volume here that we did here, um, you know, the idea is like, gosh, do we just go in and all short right here? The, you know, I, I don't I don't think so, but I think we, we have a playbook of how this will play out. And so we'll take a look at that. Um, now, of course, in a down market, you know, the my favorite kind of a strategy in a down market is very simple, is like, all right, you know, when we get a rally back to uh, the falling 21 EMA, let's buy puts. And then when we get back to, you know, minus two HR, let's cover it. The problem with this, though, is that, and this is a trade we put on in the room, and you know, I you wish I wish I had done, you know, a hundred more of these, versus like, oh, let's wait for this. Um, the problem with this is that we're not seeing, I'm not seeing a lot of retracements to the 21 EMA, all right, on the daily chart. And so I did go back into like my history and say, look, well, I know I was shorting a lot more. Um, you know, in other down markets, why, you know, what was I, what was I doing different? And so I'll show you the setups that I did then. And, you know, basically started dusting off and I'm looking, you know, looking at again, it was just, it was, and I looked and it's the thing about trading is like, man, you get, um, it's easy to kind of get used to trading one way. And then when the market changes and yeah, I certainly was, you know, cognizant of the fact that we're going down, but it's like, yeah, I just, I just need some more, 
I just need some more 21 EMAs to short. We're not getting them. So I guess I'll focus on, you know, we're so extended. I'm going to buy it for that move back to the 21 EMA. And of course that, you know, over the last couple of weeks that hasn't worked at all. And so the question is, what do you look at in this situation to look? So, so what do we want to do now? What do we, what do we expect now? How do we trade what's happening? What do we look for? So the first thing to keep in mind is remember that while history does not repeat exactly, it always rhymes. Um, and that's, I mean, if you look at a lot of the things that are happening in the world right now with, you know, Putin and the Ukraine, I mean, it's like, this is a playbook for world, how World War II started, except this time it's failing. You know, the, when Germany invaded Poland, they, you know, they, they, they took them out. And it was done in a short amount of time, and it happened so fast, uh, nobody could do anything about it. Kind of like what happened when we tried to, you know, walk out of Afghanistan. And this time, the world is coming together and trying to stop it, in, in theory. You know, we'll, we'll see. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, you know. But that's a different, that's a different topic. Okay, so more importantly, what we want to understand, you know, where are we now and what happens next? So here's what I want to point out. This is the year, this is 2000. I was trading very actively during this time. And we've had pretty much a very similar run up here. In fact, this run up on a percentage basis was more. This was Y2K. This was very, this part here was kind of very similar to the whole, you know, COVID compression, work from home. Everybody's buying from Amazon. Everybody's buying tests. Uh, similar. And then in 2000, we had the crash. Okay. This is exactly where we are right now. So we had the run up, we've had the crash. All right. And a 50% retracement, I would say is a crash. If, you know, we, I, I would defer to calling it a healthy, a healthy retracement, but, but ultimately when people talk about the 2000 crash, that's what's happened. More importantly is what happened next. Okay. So with the 2000 crash, we had a situation you know, where we rallied, we came down, we did a double bottom, and then we rallied, we came down, made a lower high, and then we got within about, mm, I want to say, I think it was like 13%-ish back to the high. And the optimism here was so strong. I mean, everybody's like, oh yeah, I told you, blah, 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 blah. And then we had the walk down from the dark depths of fiery hell. And this, um, now this, already happened in some stocks like Peloton and Shopify and stuff like that too. But I'm talking about the broader, uh, the broader indexes, right? So we've seen this already happen in some individual stocks. But notice here, not only did it come all the way down, not only did it come all the way down and take out all the gains, but then from there, no one would buy it. And, and, and it eventually actually even went out below these levels. And it took a long, 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 long time for all the excess to be scrunched out of the system. I think there's a possibility that we're going to see something like this again. Maybe not to this extent. But remember, the, the Fed right now wants, is talking wealth destruction. They need assets to come down so people stop buying crap. Okay, like guys, quit, quit buying all these houses. Of course, you know they should tell that to BlackRock, not to, um, not to a family that's out there trying to move. It's the hedge funds that are buying up all the houses, uh, but that's another story. But the most, the reason that this pattern is important is this is how humans have proven to behave after speculative fervor, and humans don't change. That's why history repeats itself. Humans, the way they look at opportunity, they, the way they look at greed, the way they look at fear is exactly the same today as it was a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. All right. I remember I was taking a history class and I got to read the journal of a merchant. It's good being, uh, it was, I mean, you know, humans have not changed very much. And so they behave very similarly, similarly in these situations. And I think that's just important to understand. Okay. What was, how long was I out? I, there's this time of day. It's like, I get these, uh, I don't know if it's hot spots. Mm. Okay. Journal of the merchant. So the main point there was that the journal of the merchant is that, you know, as you're reading through like his day to day and his hopes and dreams that could have been written yesterday. 
um, it's the same. I mean, it, you know, it's the same idea. I want to, you know, I'm going to um, try to expand my business and I want to, you know, get this girl and I want to buy this. I want to save up for this. And I would like my kids to do this. And this is, you know, 500 years ago. And I don't know about you guys, but you think like, oh, 500 years ago, people were just kind of running around um, just, you know, you know, foraging for roots and berries. Uh, when in fact it was, you know, it was human, humans, the human has, human brain has not changed very much. Um, and the motivations and the fear and the greed and all that, no, it's important to understand. And so, you know, the, the, the tulip, bu the tulip bubble in Holland, um, the South Sea bubble, all, all that kind of stuff is, it's the same, same shit, different year, right? Different, different decade, different century. And so as traders, where we would benefit from is um, understanding human behavior and what, how humans behave when there's easy money, when there's lots of speculation, and then what happens when, you know, the rug gets pulled out from under them, you know, and, and this is a chart of how that happens. And so, so I would just be very cognizant of a couple of things here. First, while it's ugly, um, we only have a huge retracement. And I think we're starting one now, by the way, but it doesn't mean that we go on and we live happily ever after. You know, I do think that ultimately we're gonna have a bigger leg down. Uh, so here's a daily chart. So this makes it a little, that was a weekly chart. So on the daily chart, this is, you know, again, this is where we are now, give or take on the NASDAQ. We kind of, these are the hardest markets to trade. If you're, al if you're already short and you're holding through everything, great. Um, but what's tough is when something is so stretched, you know, do you buy puts or are you going to get your head ripped off? Because, you know, as we know that the best rallies, actually the biggest one day rallies happen during a downtrend, during those retracements. And you don't want to get your head ripped off. But the pattern here is we're here now, okay? So, so um, if we look at a playbook here, we're here. So we could expect a rally, you know, at least back to the 21 EMA, which is a long ways away, and then a retest of the lows, okay? And then from there, we'll see. But then from there, potentially, things kind of calm down a little bit. And in fact, lulls us into a sense of complacency that we indeed may be going higher. And if we look at the, if we look at the timeline here and how this worked, then, you know, um, I would expect that that could happen through about the same timeline here. I mean, that, that would imply that the summer here, we actually see kind of a rally that gets everybody excited again. And then come late September, October, uh, the markets puke. And then during this too, and I've circled this, this is what I call an orderly decline. And an orderly decline to me is a lot easier. You get all, all these rallies back to the 20 May, you short it, you buy it back, you short it, you buy it back, you short it, buy it back. That does not happen during this initial puke because it gets really, really nasty. So that's the one of the main things that we want to understand there. So now what do we want to do? So it means we do not want to get lulled into a sense of complacency that the market is going to keep going straight down either, okay? Thinking that the market's going to go straight up um, is also, you know, is just as bad as thinking that it's going to go straight down. And we just kind of want to know when, not only when do we want to kind of um, make that change, but we can't figure it out emotionally. We can't look, you know, we've got to have tools. We've got to have kind of, you know, kind of that checklist of like, okay, when should I stop being so aggressive to the downside? When should I be careful of the downside? When should I reshort and all that kind of stuff? So remember, so the main thing here is that you know, where we are now, we've already reached that 50% retracement on the NASDAQ, which happened during the 2000 crash. We then rallied to with almost 10% of new, uh, new all-time highs. So it's very possible that we're bottoming now and we're going to have a hell of a rally into the end of the summer. Obviously, you know, that's, you know, it's going to do whatever it wants, but we just want to acknowledge that fact because right now the news is incredibly bad. Um, everything looks horrible and we just want to be, you know, kind of get a sense of like, all right, um, you know, it, essentially, when, when things are at their rosiest, everybody's the most bullish. And when things are super ugly, things are at their most bearish. And right now, the the bearish sentiment is, is, is at the highest levels I've ever seen. Okay, so we just want to keep that in mind. The point is, the market is fast and it can change fast. And the, here's the biggest problem. I'm a huge fan of the daily and weekly charts, but while they are good guides, they are way too slow to help us out in this type of environment. So what do we do? So here's the daily chart of the NASDAQ. And this is where I've experienced some frustrations this year. So in kind of a normal, you know, a normal decline, right? You come down, you rally the 21 EMA, let's get short, you know, yay, yay, yay. We come back to the 21 EMA, let's get short. Um, you know, here's the 21 EMA, let's get short. Oh my God, here's, you know, this. 
now in this, you know, basically we've dropped 3,000 points from here to here, and we've only hit the 21 EMA twice. All right, that that gets well, for my style of trading, it gets frustrating because a, um, you know, I don't like shorting. I don't like shorting in the hole, and then I'll tend to start looking at things like, well, maybe I can buy it here for a move back, and then we don't move back. So that's where I've got to look at it and say, you know, what's not serving me here is this my style of trading right now off the daily chart, which works good in a you know a slowly declining market or a rapidly uptrending market ain't working here. So when I go back and I dust off the playbook and see what's happening, it's like, oh yeah. So in this case, you can drop it down, especially on the futures, to a four hour chart. Now, all of a sudden that same move that didn't provide any opportunities on the daily chart provides actually, to, in my mind, a much more cleaner roadmap. Many more tests of the 21 EMA to short, um, much more logical movement. Um, you know, you're getting a lot. Does that make sense? So, so essentially, you you know, you can't. If you do a 30 minute chart, it's going to be too small. Um, and obviously, a five minute chart is more for scalping. But if I want to do swing trades that I could be in for you know even a couple of days, I've got to find essentially a time frame that matches the velocity of the current market. Okay, when the when the velocity of the market is as fast as it is, um, that's that's what we want to look at there. So. Um, and then here's another here's another four hour chart, and this has the Keltner channels on it. The um, the other thing you can do here is that if you guys are familiar with the hope and low buy signals, in an environment like this, when you get short, you can just kind of keep writing it down until you get the buy signal. Now that's also an opportunity that if you are looking for a retracement to the mean, that's when you could get in. All right, and so we guess what? As a, you know, as as luck would have it, um, that's exactly what's happening. That's exactly what's happening right now tonight as we're doing this. Um, if we come over here and we look at the NASDAQ, you can see we have the buy signal. So I would expect at a minimum a move back up to the 21 EMA, but also because we have hit that 50% retracement, we have hit the fire line, I suspect that this could be a little bit bigger as well. And so we want to get a, an idea of where that could potentially go. Um, you know, so we don't we don't want to we don't want to fight it either way, right? So, so then, um, so the idea with this then is that here's the tough thing as always. If we are, if we don't have a plan, what's going to happen is we get into a trade and like maybe we're watching it go and we're just like, man, I want to get me some of that. And so we buy it here or, you know, we buy it near the highs or short it near the lows. And initially there's that sense of euphoria. It's like, oh my gosh, this is, this is fantastic. This is great. And then it comes down and then, and then there's some anxiety like, oh my gosh, is this going to work or not? And then it goes through our entry point and then it's just denial. You know, it's like deer in headlights. It's like, oh, okay, I'm just going to look away. Um, maybe it'll come back. And, and I've certainly done that in this market where it's like, well, this is coming down. I'll just, you know, I'll, let me just, I'll pick up a few more here. And then it's like, oh, crap. And then it can turn into fear, like, oh, my God, what I've done. And then desperation and panic and capitulation. And, and that's obviously what we want to avoid. And, of course, other people's capitulation is our entry point. And I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of capitulation where we could at least take some trades to the upside in the short term. So what is the path forward for the rest of 2022? And we'll look at some more charts too. Um, I do, I am looking for that in, in later in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter, we're going to start to see the economic data slow due to this essentially demand destruction. Like what they're doing is going to work. Uh, inflation will start to come off. Uh, the problem is the Fed is looking in the rearview mirror. They are not looking forward. And so by the time they start to see signs that it's coming off, they're going to have overclocked it. And um, uh, they're going to have to start talking about uh, quantitative easing and stuff like that, too. So I do think that ultimately, by the we get to the end of 2023, we'll probably be in a recession. And then at that point, they're going to be forced to go back into quantitative easing. So we just want to know that this is a cycle and um, we've seen this movie before. Um, let's, yeah, I've got a couple more charts we'll look at for setups, too. And we can certainly go back to that. So, so one thing I want to point out here is I did have these, you know, back in August of 2020, I did have these, you know, three Tesla trades. And you'll notice that these were all on a 30-minute chart. So here's a squeeze, you know, boom. Here's a squeeze, boom. You know, here's a squeeze, boom. Kind of like the good old days there. Now, ironically, when I bring up Tesla on a 30-minute chart, look at it right now, um, it's the same exact setup. 
and I look at this and I kind of chide myself because it's like, well, I don't necessarily want to short Tesla because, you know, Elon Musk might tweet something. Well, 30 minute, you know, boom to the downside, boom to the downside, boom to the downside. So here's, you know, here's the setup. Here we are at the 21 EMA by puts and it's done. So the same thing that was happening to the upside in a lot of you know late 2020 2021 is also happening on a 30 minute chart here now that being said the question is well, look, well why, not, why am i not buying puts on tesla typically if i'm going to buy puts i just focus on the indexes and there's a couple of reasons for that first of all the markets move a lot faster to the downside than they do the upside okay so upside typically the stock you know the stocks just kind of plot along it's more relaxed you can go run errands you can come back and check and see what's happening when stocks go down they kind of go down like this you know it's like a roller coaster um so so uh, the reason like i like to look for stocks like a tesla in an up move is because like wow these indexes are pretty boring i'm gonna go to sleep trading these but tesla could have a you know essentially a faster move to the upside or a stock like that a high beta stock the downside, I mean, the indexes are falling too. So it kind of simplifies your life to just focus on, say, like the spiders and the Qs or, you know, IWM and DIA. Um, also, they're very, very liquid and the spreads are tight. Now, does that mean you shouldn't short stocks like Tesla or anything like that? Uh, absolutely not. Of course, you know, you can, you can buy puts on a lot of stocks that are going to go down in this environment. But what I've found is that sometimes it's easier in a down market to, you know, say, have one or two positions focused on the indexes that could be a little bigger versus say 10 put positions on stocks because when the markets reverse uh it's it can be very nasty and very quick and it's hard to get out of 10 positions that are screaming against you uh, that are not necessarily liquid than you know getting out of the spiders which if you did a market order your slippage would only be three cents so that's part of it. Um, and then sometimes you're right, like the market goes down, but then, you know, using Tesla as an example, like, oh, this market looks like crap, I'm gonna buy some puts, and then Elon tweets, and, you know, Tesla's up 50 points on the day. So does this mean to avoid long puts on stocks? Of course not. There's certainly a lot of opportunities buying puts on stocks, but I, I think it's actually, it makes your life easier just to like, well, focus on the indexes first. And then, you know, if you find some stocks you wanna add to it, that's great, but the indexes, they they do they can make your life easier in um, this this type of environment. All right, so what we want to look at here then is now remember one of the biggest drivers of markets. If we go back and look at this monthly chart, when we see these dots, okay, that's called a squeeze. There was a squeeze. You know they don't happen very much, but when they do, you typically get the biggest moves, right? And you know obviously that was a huge move. And more importantly is when so when you see these light blue lines. Um, essentially, it means that each bar, the momentum is increasing. But once they turn dark blue, it's basically telling you that the move is over. And we've known this for some time. It's like, okay, yeah, we've seen this. Um, in, and a part of it is kind of like, yeah, we'll probably come off a little bit, but it won't be too bad because obviously, you know, the Fed is very accommodative here. And then, boom, the Fed decided to start getting aggressive and start getting hawkish. And for the first time since March 2020, we're through the 21 EMA on the monthly chart. So we are officially no longer in an uptrend on the monthly chart. This could be the start of a move, you know, all the way down here. So as long as this momentum is lower, um, we want to be cognizant of the fact that you know, we, the only way this thing is going to have a significant up, up move is that if the momentum shifts here on the monthly chart. And at this point, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Another tool here that this is one, you know, I, I haven't even looked at in a couple of years because frankly, it wasn't necessary, is the, these are what I call the institutional, institutional bands. And I'll, I'll give you guys the code for them. Um, they're Kellner channels, but they're set at a much, much, much different levels. And notice here that the bottom in March 2020 was at this lower band, right? And from there, we rocketed higher. It's very rare that we push beyond it, but this how, that's how strong the market was in August of 2020. And then in a strong market, you're typically going to trade between the highest institutional band and the, and the lowest one. Of course, this is the mean here. And... Um, and you can see that we spend a lot of time there. And then when we broke, okay, well, this is a huge move down. We got to that first band, came back to the mean, and then, you know, boom, came back to the mean. And now here we are at the lower band. So part of the reason why I think we got to be really, really, really careful here on the downside is we're at the same institutional support zone 
today, like right now, like this is a chart that was taken um, seven minutes before the webinar started as we were in March 2020. Now, it does not mean in any way, shape or form that we're going to have a rally like this. But the idea that we want to get aggressively short right here is insanity because this is a very, very, this is a level that's been very, very proven. Uh, you know, and look, all we would need is a rally to, you know, 320-ish. And then from there, we could start walking back down again. So that's something that we want to be careful of. And if we look at the spiders here, same thing. And remember, during uh, March 2020, that's the only time I've seen them break through to the downside. They did not break through on the queues. It was just a much tighter band going into that, but we're at that same level here so the idea that from here we could get a rally back to 413 absolutely yes and in fact that to me that seems higher probability that we're going to go up um, than go down from here but that doesn't mean that you know we bought them and everybody's going to hold hands and, and live happily together um, but the other thing you can do on this for day trading or for shorter term trades is do the hourly chart with the same settings and all of a sudden what once looked kind of like chaos looks very manageable so it's like, oh man, we come back to the mean. Great, let's short it, you know. And you know, when, once you get here, you're not going to push much below it. Great. Here we push through a little bit, right? Here we push through a little bit. Um, does that make sense? So all so all of a sudden, and I and I, you know, totally blanked on these because I used to use these all the time. But these are what I simply call like the institutional railroad tracks, and they're going to make life, um, they're going to make life a lot, a lot, a lot easier. So I'll give you the settings for these. So these are just Keltner channels. You know, there's nothing magic in it except the settings are what institutions use. So you're using, uh, instead of a 21 period moving average, you're using the 200, okay? It's based on the 200 and they're doing five ATR and 10 ATR and then these are just simple, all right? So you can just, you know, you can create those on any platform and those are some things that I've kind of taken out and dusted off for this current environment that we are in um now the other thing too is just it's uh, what i say is is learning to sit through the uncomfortableness now when you are in a bull market the most important thing you can do is learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable and this was very true last year and i remember this because we i was at spring break with my kids in mexico when i was in this trade and you know i was you know we were fishing and doing stuff like that but during this time i also had this trade on that just was not working really well. And I was just like, it was pretty annoying. And in fact, it was basically three and a half weeks of kind of pain, but the setup never wavered, okay? And then ultimately, of course, this paid off and it turned out to be one of the biggest trades of my career. Um, in a bull market, you learn to sit through the uncomfortableness, okay? That is not true in a bear market. In a bear market, you cut things off at the knees you know, when they're not working, because if you don't, it can get a lot worse very, very quickly. And th and that's, that's one of the things. And sure, you don't want to, you know, you got to, you know, use some parameters, but the idea of like, well, I'm just going to keep adding to this, you know, like this trade, I added to it here and here and here and here. Um, and then ultimately, of course, it worked out. But in a, in a very quick down market, you know, if the trend is down and you're buying it, you can get destroyed. Uh, that's, that's basically called martingaling. So, so you just want to be cognizant of that. Um, and then this, you know, and it, for those of you that haven't seen this, this was the biggest trade I'd ever done at that point. And it was like a, a $4 million trade in my toss account and um, almost a million dollars in my Tastyworks account. And it was insanity. Um, but those are the kind of things that can happen when the environment's right. So, so the idea with all this is that, you know, it, when I first got into trading, it took me like eight years to really get into a groove. And and, and throughout my career, anytime I feel like I know it all, that's typically when the market rears back and punches me in the face. And it's not about ever, ever thinking you know it all. It's about going back to basics. It's going back to a checklist. It's being humble and like, all right, what's this, you know, what 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 is going on here? And and once I always, you know, go back the go back to my roots there, it it always, it you know, it always gets better. And that's what's been you know, interesting in this market is kind of like, oh, wow, this is actually turning into something very similar to what happened in 2000. And we haven't seen this in a long time. And it's really just, you know, bringing out the stuff that worked during that time. So 
So what I've done is I'm going to do this class on Saturday. And if you guys are a member, by the way, if you're already a member of Simpler Trading, if, like meaning that, you know, if you're in the gold room or any of our subscriptions, this class is going to be free uh, for you. If you're not a member, though, it is. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. We already these are st things already I've already talked about. I always like to say that, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I always, you know, trading and life to me are kind of intertwined. Um, you know, different things where, um, you know, this is a, this is a this is a trip where we did you know we did to Africa. Well, this is because of trading, right? Um, this was a. Um, I, I love this because I'm explaining to this kid what I do for a living, and Dylan's like, "Man, I've heard this like ten times already." And uh, this is my oldest son, James, and I were in Africa, and then tr you know trading, getting you know being able to work with your dogs and stuff like that is always fun. It's always kind of intertwined. But at the end of the day, I always I always find if I'm spending too much time in front of the computer, I'm making it too hard. I want to be able to do it in a way where you know if I'm traveling or I'm out in the fields, I can just check my phone and see how everything's doing and have a good sense of what's happening. So during this, what I'm going to do is during on Saturday, I'm going to show you guys all these setups, and. I'm going to show you it on tools that are they're all free tools on your platform. So if you're you know newer to us, and you don't have any of our premium tools, you don't need the premium tools. But then I'll show you, of course, how you can enhance it. Like, well, what if we change this to the 10x bars? You know, what, how would that be different? Um, you know, versus looking at the DMI and the ADX down there. So I'll give you guys all this stuff there. So you know, again, this workshop, um, what's gonna it's gonna be is it will be a couple of things happening here. I'm gonna do the four hour workshop on Saturday, May 14th, which is like in 48 hours, and then I'm gonna do live trading May 17th and 14th. And if you guys are familiar with Cody, who's been really killing it in this market, he'll be doing trading on May 23rd and May 26th. So if you would like to do this, um, again, if you are already a member. Uh, the good news is this is free so you will you you get to go to this class it's just kind of like a hey thank, thank you for being a member um let's just spend some time together and kind of get you know review the things that are working here i'm going to show you all the setups and give you all the checklists so that's free for you if you're not a member normally this is 590 dollars and we're doing this for 97 dollars just because i think that this information is important enough and can and help a lot of people in this environment I think it's just important to get your hands. And so again, that's a four hour workshop. If you can't attend, it's gonna be recorded, so no big deal. Um, also, you'll get, if you're not a member, you'll get a 30 day trial to our gold. And if you like it, you can renew um, You can renew at a discounted rate, which is fantastic as well. If you are interested in doing the live trading with Cody and myself, normally 997, um, and that would be 497. And that would include um, everything here and then if you are looking at this saying like you know what i love the idea of a gold room where i'm getting alerts from all these folks and market commentary um you can do this it's an annual discounted subscription to the room and of course you know you get all that there so let me go through this so if you'd like to sign up for this um you just go to to this link here simplertrading.com forward slash workshop unfortunately you cannot click on that you got to type it into your browser and of course if you have any questions you can give us a call or email us usually easier too just support at simplertrading.com um yeah ken we can look at gold we'll look at let's look at a couple of charts too um so yeah let uh, let me see i just want to if you go to this page well here let me bring up the page so we can review the page together simplertrading.com forward slash workshop So if you go to the page, um, all right, so if you go to the page, and that's the link right there, just choose the package you want. If you're a member, I think what'll happen is when you go to this page, you won't actually see this, maybe or maybe not. But again, remember, if you're a member, it's it's you already get this. Um, this will take place in one day and 15 hours and 55 minutes, and um, and there you got that too. If you if you are a member and you want to do the live trading, uh, there it is. Then you can do that because um, you you know because the classes include. So I'm not going to go through and read all this, but if you just want more information, there's a lot of great information on here that just kind of gives you more you know more 
details about what's happening. Um, if you've never tried our Options Gold membership, that's kind of where you get all, especially if you're newer, I mean, that's where you get all the different kind of market outlooks. Allison's been killing it on her pinning trades with the SPX. Um, Cody's been killing it with his trades in this crazy market. Um, there's just there there's just a lot of variety in there, uh, which is great. And the pro package has four days of live trading. Again, normally this is a 997, but again, we think it's important enough in this environment. We just want to make sure that people actually have, because in our room, what will happen is we focus really on, oh, here's a setup and what's happening. When we do something like this, it's more about specifically trading on the specific strategy, just so you can get some practice and doing it. Um, and then from there, if you're newer to options, there is an actual class that comes with this and it's just an options 101. So if you are newer to options, don't, um, you know, don't be intimidated because we'll walk you through that. Um, also, you, another bonus here are these utility labels. You can just put on the top of your chart and think or swim. And then they just kind of give you like, oh, what's the ADX and, you know, different things like that. Because they do help in setting trends. And then the elite package, essentially, if you're looking at this and you're like, man, I want to do this and I just, I, I'm just going to sign up for a year and, and take advantage of that discount, you can do that. And the gold room is great because it's a live chat all day. And if you're not in front of your computer, you can actually listen to it on your iPhone or Android. Uh, there's trade alerts. They'll come right to your, you know, right through push notification. Um, there's, there's a free trading room also that where we do more training. You have access to that. There's a weekly watch list. There's premium, you know, video reviews, and it's good to have information like that in an environment like this because you know things are pretty crazy. All right, so um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. I want to, yeah. Here's Cody. Oh, that was quick. Where'd he go? There he goes. So um, the cool thing about Cody is he's also super disciplined, and I found this too. My dad was in the Marines, and so I found that you know. People in the Marines, they learn, they learn discipline really well. And it's kind of awesome watching him put that to work in his trades. And so that's that's something too that an environment like this that that's so so important. Um all right. So I'm gonna end it on this slide and then happy to look. You know, there was somebody that asked about gold. Um, if we look at gold with these institutional bands, now something like gold, um, I'm going to come over here and put in GC and switch to a daily chart. And you can see we're kind of getting a little bit of a bounce there as well. But if we come over here, and you can see how logical this looks, right? It's like, oh, okay, this looks a little more logical now. If we look at this on a daily chart, it's kind of like, um, now, you see all this weird stuff on there? All that is is a setting, which we don't necessarily need. I don't need open interest, and I don't need contract chains events. That'll clean it up. And then you can kind of see like, you know, you can see that when gold petered out here, it petered out right at that upper level. And now we're back to the mean. So it'd be, it'd have been nice if this level would have held, but I do fully expect that this will hold and we'll start working our way back up again. Because remember, everything always reverts back to the mean. If we look at Apple here and to say like, all right, Hey guys, looks like a, that was funny. We actually were able to watch in real time John's internet uh, drop off as he was trying to pull up the symbol of Apple. For a second, I was looking at it like, oh man, it looks like his charts are slow. Oh, I think he's back. All right, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. <laughs> yeah, Daryl, I don't know what, I don't know what happened there. Um, does that sound, can you guys hear it okay? Yeah, when uh, when I saw the beast in the front yard, that's when the, I think they took out the they took out the internet. So yeah, so that's Apple. Um, what's another one here? We've been watching. Um, we've been, uh, gosh, you know, some of the oil. Or let's see, like crude oil. Crude oil, of course, has been on fire, right? So, you know, where is it now? Um, this was very very rare and this is this you can tell when there's like a massive short squeeze and this happens but now we're kind of trading in a more you know normal or normal range and if we look at iwm which has been hammered as well it's also down here at these lower bands right so we just want to kind of keep in mind a couple of things here one is you know 
we don't want to be too bullish at the highs and we don't want to be too bearish at the lows. Um, I do not think that the quote unquote, the bottom is in, but I do think that we are setting up here for, you know, a tradable move to the upside. I could be dead wrong on that. That's why we have stop losses. And, um, you know, again, with all this kind of stuff, my goal is this Saturday is we will go through all this stuff, you know, really just kind of keep it kind of simple and we'll go through and look at these charts. I'm going to make sure that you guys all have access to all of the free tools I like to use. And then if you don't, if you're not familiar with things like 10 X bars and stuff like that, I'm going to show you them, but also show you a workaround if that's not something that you're looking for. Um, you know, the whole goal of something like that is simply to make your life a little bit easier. Yeah, the and the, yeah, and all and and the settings, um, the the settings, all that kind of stuff. I'm happy to share with you for um, the Keltner channels. It was instead of a 21 period moving average, just use 200, and then instead of one and a half ATR, you use five, and then you use 10. And so the live trading days. Typically, what we do on the live trading days is. Um, being on the mic all day is exhausting. So typically we'll be on the mic for a couple hours. And then from there, uh, essentially it's kind of typing and answering questions. If there's another setup that pops up, posting that. And then, um, and you know, just kind of depending on what's going on that day. Um, John, I watched some of your trading and one of the comments made was when the SKU gets below 120, then start considering getting back in the market and making some purchases. Yes. Does this apply if the 10 day moving average of the put call ratio is also at 0.9? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So a lot of the things I look at that are that show either extreme bearishness or extreme bullishness, everything right now is actually showing more extreme bullishness, meaning not that the charts look good. OK, when I say extreme bullishness, I don't mean the charts. I mean the internals uh, that show that we're at possible inflection points. So I think right now that being short is kind of a scary is the riskier trade um but you know it's always tricky when things are being unwound you know if there's a hedge fund that needs to unload a billion dollars worth of stock um you know they're not going to be looking at an oscillator going like well we can't do it right now we're so oversold you know they have to do it and so that's why remember the tools on your chart that it's not magic it's just math and but it does help kind of hone down probabilities Yeah, so Trader Lay. So, so during the Saturday class, I will go through, um, you know, we'll, all the stuff that we kind of talk through, we'll just kind of go through in more detail. So you can kind of have a checklist of, all right, so these institutional Keltners, boom, this is what you want to look at. Um, you know, the setups that were good and, and stuff like that, too. And again, if you remember, remember the class is free. And if you're not, instead of having to do 597 bucks, it's just a tiny, I call it investment of $97. That's like, um, you know, as one of my favorite sayings from a was trader was Tony Laporta. You know, it's like, oh, that's like trading a one lot, which is like kissing your sister. And I always like to ask him, like, well, how do you know what it's like to kiss your sister? But, um, you know, anyway, it's just it's one of those things where it's uh, uh, it's it's a it's a small investment in yourself to, I think, learn some tools that can really help during the course of this market and produce a really nice ROI. Yeah, the quant pivots have been fine. Um, we've been pushing through them this week, but we're starting to move back up through them. So, you know, we've definitely had some extreme, um, extreme levels. The monthlies are holding up just fine. And uh, I, I, someone, one of the uh, one of the members that I talked to, she emails me every day. I don't know if you're in here. Um, she uses the two-hour pivots and just loves them. Yeah, every day. Like, yep, made another three hundred bucks. And I was like, wow, I should probably look at those two-hour pivots. Yeah, so Philip, the so the the we're gonna go through um, essentially the setups that are kind of that are working in a market like this, um, and we'll also cover checklists of what what to do. You know, if we do actually resume in an uptrend and things like that too. But the idea is to come out of that with kind of a playbook. Yeah, Helen, I, I do. The, you know, I I think the biggest error I've made over the last you know six weeks is really just kind of focusing on the bigger charts, you know, like the weeklies and stuff like that. And it's just, you know, missing a lot of opportunities versus drilling down to, you know, like the two hour levels and stuff like that. All right. All right. Well, I want to, uh, we've already been here for an hour and 15 minutes. I want to respect everybody's time. I will leave this up here. Uh, remember, you, if you have any questions, all the answers are right here. 
Um, this four-hour workshop will be this Saturday, May 14th, and that will be from uh, basically 12, 12 noon central. Let's see if I can write this out. 12 noon central. And then the live trading, the dates are on there. I think it's like the 17th, and there's the 24th and the 26th, but the dates are, the dates are all on there. All right? All right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining. Have a fantastic evening for those of you that are joining me on Saturday, and I look forward to seeing you then. And um, as Al for whatever reason, I always like how Allison signs off, and I'm just going to borrow her phrase, may the trade be with you, and have a great night.